for those who might not know me, I'm Katie Franklin, Science Manager for TNC's Palmyra program. Um, first, I just wanted to share that the purpose of these town hall meetings is to periodically invite speakers to share information about Palmyra Toll that's relevant to our current work and helps add context and meaning for those that are currently stationed on the atoll. Um, <clears throat> today, we're joined by the entire crew that's currently at Palmyra, including Fish and Wildlife staff and TNC staff and volunteers and the Corral Moore research team. And we're happy that a lot of others from TNC and US Fish and Wildlife are also here to join us. So thank you everybody for, for tuning in today. Um, and now I'm pleased to introduce Jesse Johnson to share with us some of his research and findings on the history of Palmyra. Jesse is the curator of and founder of the Palmyra Atoll Digital Archive, a really cool website dedicated to sharing findings from his research on Palmyra's history. Um, in 2020, I believe, Jesse also completed a historical compendium of Palmyra's Western Lagoon that presents information he's uncovered on how the Western Lagoon ecosystem has changed over time. And this information is really important for us as managers to understand since we need to know about Palmyra's history in order to inform future management actions and priorities. Um, and for those of you currently at Palmyra, there's a laminated copy of this compendium in case you haven't seen it yet down at the station and I highly recommend that you check it out. Um, so with that, thank you, Jesse, for being here with us today to share some of your findings and now I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks Katie. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you and I'm gonna mute, I'm gonna turn my video off just for the sake of bandwidth. Okay. All right, so let me pull this up. All right, give me one second. Okay. Is the presentation up? Sorry. I should know how to do this. Yep, uh, everybody see the welcome. welcome. Perfect. Yep, that's it. So, uh, yeah, like Katie said, my name is Jesse Johnson, um, and I uh, really excited to be here. Um, I love talking about Palmyra whenever I get the chance, um, and I got to work on the uh, Lagoon Compendium project, like she mentioned last year, which was a, a really fun opportunity to kind of condense uh, you know, years of research and then new research that I had always wanted to do um, with some of the really important work you guys are doing and, and help support that by offering insights into how Palmyra has been used and utilized and um, visited over the years. Um, so to get started, like she also said, I, I started uh, the palmyraarchive.org or the Palmyra Atoll Digital Archive uh, back in 2016 as a way to kind of collect and share uh, a lot of the material that I'd been finding um, just casually on the Atoll. Um, and it's been a really great opportunity to um, have, have people reach out and share personal stories, um, you know, family heirlooms, uh, lots of material that was just kind of sitting in boxes or, uh, or closets or, or museums that, that didn't have a place for it. Um, it's been really exciting to get to know uh, Palmyra's history through the people that have been part of it. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that's just at palmyraarchive.org. Um, I spent a lot of time earlier this year trying to simplify some of the navigation and, and we've gotten really good feedback that it's uh, a lot easier to navigate than it used to be. Um, and so I'd, I'd love to always up for feedback. So if you guys have a chance to visit it and have any advice, recommendations, corrections, anything, please let me know. I, I love getting feedback on it. So uh, just to start off a little bit about me, my name is, again, Jesse Johnson. I was born and raised just outside of Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, I still live there with my family. My wife, Larissa, and I have uh, five daughters. So in uh, order of appearance, uh, there's Kindred. Ever and then Fable, Ballad, and Whistler are all five. Um, so when I am not spending time with them or busy with that, <laughs> uh, I try to research Palmyra's history. And then uh, my full time gig is as the IT director for a small graduate school near Indianapolis. 
but today um, I wanted to talk about uh, some of the key findings uh, related to the lagoon system and specifically what came out of the naval construction projects. Um, the unofficial timeline there is 1939 to 1944 although there were still some um, CAA, FAA construction that went on after 1944. But really the, the bulk of the, um, depending on who you ask, damage, improvements, modifications, uh, the bulk of that was from 39 to 44. And uh, thinking that I knew just about everything I could about that period after, after researching the compendium, we just found a, a wealth of material that got into the, some of the specifics about things that were brought there, things that were used on Palmyra during the war. Um, and I was hoping to share some of that with you guys today. So to start, just wanted to give a general um, overview of the naval construction timeline. And I will say that there's a, I'm gonna oversimplify some of the relationships between what was uh, private contractors through uh, CAA, FAA, Pan Am, and what was the uh, military involvement. Uh, it, it does get a little gray in there, but I, I, I'm just admitting out of the gate that <clears throat> there's a lot more nuance to that, uh, you know, who did what and who was responsible for what that I don't necessarily go into. But um, that being said, um, it all started November 1st, 1939, a small survey team showed up and their job was to draw up plans for an initial channel to connect Palmyra's Western Lagoon with the open ocean. I mean, the, the, everybody knew that the hardest part about visiting Palmyra was getting past the reefs, um, going all the way back to its discovery in 1802 when it was easier to come at Palmyra from the uh, Eastern end. Um, it was the most challenging part by far. So to, to undergo any kind of serious construction work, they would need to solve that problem first. After those plans were drawn up on January 26th of 1940, uh, the first group of PNAB, which was the Pacific Naval Air Base's construction workers, so those were private contractors, showed up and began to work. And by April, they had blasted a channel wide enough for an army dredge, the Sacramento, to get through and uh, start um, bringing supplies and more formal materials into the lagoon and onto um, the land mass masses that were already there. Um, and at that point, it really just started to take off. There was a brief delay in December of 1941 um, after the attack on Pearl Harbor. There was a shelling of Palmyra a week later. Uh, the only thing that was damaged was the dredge Sacramento, um, but uh, thankfully, no other damage, no lives lost. So then in 1942, June of 1942, um, everything was in place to to get all of the buildings and facilities and the larger land masses convinced. So every island, uh, except for Sand, Barren, and Bird, were connected by causeway. Jesse, you got muted. Yeah. Jesse, Sorry, guys. You... Okay, there we yep. go. I'm going to go back. What was the last thing you guys heard? When did I uh, blank out? Causeway. Causeway. Okay. So let's just go to, yeah, 44. So as of 44, after about two and a half years of heavy use by especially the Navy, but also the Marines, um, <clears throat> salvage and recovery operations began. So the Navy actually started moving unused supplies, building materials, anything they could further out into the Pacific where it was more needed. Uh, and by May of 1945, even the searchlights were gone, underground structures were filled in. Anything that was temporary, shacks, squads, and huts was moved out and, uh, and moved on. Um, and then by October of, uh, October 1st, 1946, um, the last shipment of equipment and materials left Palmyra, and by all accounts, the Navy was essentially off of the atoll. So I, I like to start this out by saying that um, as I was going through the material, the amount of the amount of men that worked on this project worked on Palmyra was just it was incredible, and the work they did was incredible, and. So many of them describe how beautiful it was, how interesting it was, how much they enjoyed being there despite the the heat and 
the ocean and the uh, everything. It, they just really enjoyed being there. Um, and they did their best, as best as they knew, to not damage the atoll, which, which I know sounds ironic considering the outcome, but they really did think of themselves as giving Palmyra a, a greater purpose, using it to protect their homeland, um, trying their best to care about it um, and take care in whatever way they could. Uh, there's a quote from David Woodbury's book. I'll read here. Uh, so Palmyra under its palms was making ready to welcome the vast armada of bombers headed west. And the engineers were proud of the fact that they had done all this without injuring the natural beauty of the place. And again, I recognize that that's not, not a super accurate statement, but um, considering some of the other places and the other things that were done to land masses in the Pacific, um, Palmyra was treated with a lot more respect. And if nothing else, it, uh, I'm just grateful it's not glowing with radiation or uh, still actively occupied. So I always try to keep that in mind when I, uh, when I read through this stuff. So all that being said, um, we're going to look at three key takeaways today. Um, first is the construction methods used to build the base and expand the land. Um, then the flow restrictions that were placed on the lagoon by the earthworks. And finally, the foreign materials introduced into the lagoons themselves um, by both the construction activities uh, and the men living there. So the Navy, like, like I said before, the Navy knew that the first priority was getting a channel into Palmyra. Um, there just wasn't an easy way to get anything inside to the lagoons. Um, and in these photos, which are from 1935, so prior to any kind of construction activities, uh, you can hopefully see that there really is just, there's a, you know, the thinnest area is still pretty long as far as trying to get anything over there. But they immediately identified that um, if they cut a channel right through that spot, which by the way, on, on earlier charts is always marked as the best way to get in. It was already kind of a natural low area in the reefs. If they could cut a channel through, then they could, they could get all the materials and men they needed inside the lagoons. So they hired uh, both private contractors and Hawaiian divers um, to work through what was a very unique process. Um, Starting out with uh, a group of men actually standing on the reefs, uh, oftentimes up to you know six feet of water, so they're basically bouncing on their toes. They would hand drill six foot holes into the reef, drop a capped stick of dynamite in, and they would do this every 22 inches in 40 foot rows, and then they would blast them one at a time. And over the course of three months, they had a 40 foot wide, seven foot deep channel which allowed for larger vessels to pass through and the first permanent structures to be to be built. But if you can imagine just standing in that water for you know, 9, 10, 12 hours a day, drilling holes and blasting, it was just, it was insane. And like I said, this allowed for larger machines to come through. So the Army Dredge Sacramento immediately moved in and started expanding that. Um, and by June of 1942, main channel had been dredged. So 200 feet wide, 20 feet deep, that was their goal. And they, they hit it after two years. Um, there was an additional 750 foot wide, 10 foot area dredged um, in the Western and Central Lagoons. And that was for use as a seaplane runway. The aggregate from all that coral dredging was used for everything. Um, raw materials for the expansion of land, building of roads and the production of concrete. So they, they built a concrete plant on the atoll um, it was uh, on Cooper, as soon as Cooper was large enough to handle it, about a third of the way down the runway. Um, prior to World War II, engineers had a long debate about the quality and durability of concrete made from coral aggregate, especially when it was you know, mixed with salt water. But um, places like Palmyra kind of proved, for better or worse, that it's, it lasts. It's a valuable material. Whether that's good or not, um, they proved the case. So does anybody know, and I know there's some, I wanna make everybody answer if you want to, but does anyone know which concrete structures were not made locally? There's only, only one. Does anybody know what it is? Seaplane ramp. Nailed it, yeah. You guys are always, so, yeah. I never talk to anybody who knows all this stuff about Palmyra, so it's, uh, it's great. Yeah, you got it. Seaplane ramps, which are sitting there. Would've been nice if I didn't have those up. 
So you can see here in 1962 and 79, I tried to find some further spread apart, but it really is incredible to look at that and go that they just, yeah, they stuck around. Um, but they knew that these things had to hold an incredible amount of weight. They didn't trust the local concrete. So the Navy came up with this ridiculous procedure that they they tested for months in uh, Honolulu. And I still don't fully understand it, but it's it's really incredible to read about. Basically, they built these huge slabs in Honolulu. They shipped them off on barges and it took them forever to get out there because if the water got too rough, they'd have to ditch some of them to keep the boats from from flipping over. So they only got a few at a time out. And once they were there, they would drive these steel H-beams into pre-dug holes. They would seal and grate the holes with metal and go further and further down. Divers would then cut off and cap the beams and a crane would place the slab on top of it. And it took a couple months, even once they arrived to get it in, but um, like, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly uh, taken a beating, kept on going. And again, it's it, there's a couple documents that describe this process in more detail. They're really incredible to read, um, but it's just a it's a really good example too of the kind of challenges the guys faced once they got out there um, that that nobody had ever done before. So moving on, um, the flow restrictions placed on the lagoons. Um, as I'd said before, the roads and causeways connected all but essentially three of the islands. Uh, most of the those roads have been washed away, removed, overgrown, um, but they they were the only reason the Navy was able to operate on Palmyra during during the war. Um, there was just such distance between the, the islets. Um, there was about 12 miles of roads, depending on how you looked at it, and there were there was some really fun stuff to find. So you had to have a driver's license to drive on the roads, and you had to obey the speed limits, which were posted regularly around those roads. It was usually single lane for most of the causeways, so you also had to make sure that you didn't start out before or at the same time somebody else was. But assuming you did that, you could drive supplies from one end to the other, um, drop them off anywhere you needed to. And there were um, there was a couple couple soldiers that that was literally their job. They would just drive materials all day long around the place. So uh, unfortunately for anything living in the lagoons, uh, the roads were just terrible. They uh, combined with the expansion and interconnection uh, of all but three of the main islands. Um, it really left nowhere for water to move in and out except for the main channel. And this, this new geography was in place by at least June of 1942. And even though over time, small gaps would form between several of the ocean facing islands, much of it remained in place well into the 1980s. Um, we know by 1958, the causeway leading from North and South Fighter Islands to the main road had collapsed. Other sections were so overgrown with foliage or thinned down that um, water was going over or around them, um, and they were certainly no longer functioning roads. But they did continue to prevent a healthy flow of ocean water, especially in the Western Lagoon. Now, some of this degrading is attributed to hasty construction methods and the fact that they were making this up as they went along, general weather conditions. But we think the most significant impact came from two major flooding events in 1947 and 1958, where at least the entire runway, so all of Cooper was underwater for a period of time. And there may have been other events as well, but those were the two that were recorded in, in the documents we found. So that brings us to the final topic, which is foreign materials introduced. So I mentioned before that certain materials like concrete were locally sourced, but uh, and even water was collected by, by rain, just, just as it is today, or by evaporators, um, which were in place during the, the wartime and, and after when the CAA was there. Um, and some of their food, at first at least, came from the oceans and lagoons. But nearly everything else um, needed to sustain an average of 2,000 men and their equipment had to be brought in. Now, much of the machines and materials were eventually salvaged, like I mentioned before, taken to other locations. But the consumables, fuel and the materials used to repair them, as well as the men station there, were an ongoing source of waste even after the war. Uh, based on naval records, we know human waste, uh, liquid waste in general, was piped 
from facilities all around uh, into latrines and from those latrines into the western and central lagoons. Uh, some of that piping and where emptying the lagoons can be seen here. Um, we know there were other locations as well, but these were kind of the obvious spots. And that was, uh, again, it, it was a pretty ingenious engineering method to collect it the way they did buried in the coral. Unfortunately, it did mean that it, it tended to dump out in the same places. So uh, we're doing a little math, which is always really exciting in presentations. Uh, if we uh, if we run some averages here, so 2,000 occupants at 365 pounds of waste per year, which is the average for a person over three years, 2,000 times 365 times three, we get 2.2 million pounds or 1 million kilograms of human waste over that period. So for comparison's sake, that's like seven blue whales or 11,000 Jeff Goldblums. It's a lot, a lot of stuff. Now, throughout the war, human waste aside, aircraft, ships visiting Palmyra to refuel, restock, give soldiers a chance to relax. Um, all of that was present constantly. Um, at any one time, there could be dozens of aircraft on the runways, heavy machinery for working construction and doing repairs, and a lagoon full of seaplanes and warships sitting outside. So this month, Palmyra needed significant facilities for storing fuel and oil, especially as the war went on. And Palmyra, you know, thankfully never saw a lot of action, but that meant it was a good place to go back and safely refuel. So this is a quote from one of the Naval Summary Reports. Read real quick. Uh, this is on Cooper Island, two 200,000 gallon tank farms for aviation gasoline, barrel fuel oil tanks, 17,500 barrel diesel tanks, on Mang Island, there were two aviation gasoline tank farms, 125,000 gallon, and the other 175,000 gallon capacity, 633 foot shield steep bulkhead, and a fuel oil tank farm. And some of these photos, uh, the one at the top is, is from the 1950s. So this is what's just stayed there for quite a while, but that was one of the barrel farms described in the, in the quote. Um, and then on the left, uh, that's one of the 25,000 gallon gasoline tanks. And on the right is the 19,000 barrel fuel storage tank under construction early on. Just massive projects for storing these materials. So all in all, it's about 3.3 million gallons or 12 and a half million liters. And that's, that's active storage. So that's how much would have, would have been maintained as much as possible. And, uh, we know some of that, quite a bit of that, unfortunately, after the war that couldn't be removed, um, simply seeped out, leaked out, or was left behind. So for comparison, that's five Olympic swimming pools full of material, fuel and oil material, or 16,500 Jeff Goldblums. It's a lot. So as I said, when while there were several salvage projects between 44 and 1946 especially, there's no mention that fuel was ever removed at all, uh, especially those stored in the underground tanks, obviously. Um, and based on a number of reports and firsthand accounts, uh, there were cleanup projects undertaken by the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, both in 1987 and 1997, because material was leaking out, um, mostly from the underground storage tanks that it's very likely people just forgot were there, and from the barrel farms that just kind of sat in the jungle. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of that just, like I said, just kind of stayed. So I know I went uh, really fast on that, and that's a lot of material, but um, I wanted to give you guys a chance to ask any questions you have. Um, anything about that material I brought up that uh, you guys might want more information on, or anything in general? That I might be able to answer questions about. Thanks, Jesse. This was awesome to hear. Um, so interesting. Every time I've I've heard this material, I learned something new. Um, will you say again how how many men were there at 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 the most? And then I'm curious, sort of like. Was that a steady population or did it flux a lot or like sort of what was the 
time, like how the population changed over time? Yeah, there, there was a lot of fluctuation. So from, um, from the first show up in, in 1940 till or like early 42, it was anywhere from 200 to 500 people. And that was largely um, private contractors, um, Hawaiian civilians, uh, people that were there just doing the construction work. But as, as soon as Pearl Harbor happened, uh, the Marines showed up. I mean, within two weeks, there were Marine forces on the atoll. And from 42 to 44, it was probably closer to, I don't know, 1,500 to 2,000. Uh, it could be more, but that was that was where the averages started to fall. So it, it really started to average out around that 2,000 number. From, from 44 to 45, uh, it was, I'm sorry, from 43 to 45, it was kind of a, you'd have a couple hundred guys there, but then two or three ships show up for, um, a couple days of leave and you've got a sudden influx of two to 3000 soldiers off the boats onto the atoll. So it, we know that it could handle, it was rated to handle five to 6,000 troops. Um, we don't have records saying that it ever actually did. And obviously they would have been pretty cramped, but that was the facilities mandate. Um, even if the men were sleeping on the ships, they could cycle on and off the, uh, the atoll itself. So that's kind of how we get to an average of 2,000, but it was a it was a fluctuating number. And then, of course, after the war, um, there was anywhere from 150 to 200 um, civilians living on Palmyra from 1946 to 1951 as part of the CAA uh, group that lived and worked there. So it, it kind of trailed off at the end, too. It wasn't like, a, you know, suddenly no one's there anymore. Well, wow, thanks. Um, I see Chad has a question. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Thank you so much, Jesse. It's always amazing to uh, hear some of the history that you've compiled. I have a pretty specific question about a structure that looks like uh, three sort of ovens in the jungle in an area that... Oh, <laughs> uh, the pizza ovens, right? Yeah, the pizza ovens. Any yeah. idea what the function of those pizza ovens may have been? And for those who haven't seen the pizza ovens, I think they're near plot 20 or um, that the coconut crew cleared uh, like a couple of years ago. Yeah, that's uh, there's, a, there's a couple of theories. Um, I ran it by some people that uh, that should know, uh, people that, have, that are more familiar with... Um, wartime naval um, construction. There's there's two pretty good guesses from what I've seen. One is that it was either, um, uh, that was part of the morgue. So there were two hospitals, one of which was underground um, and around that area. And then that was filled in and replaced by the hospital that's still there. Um, but it, it was pretty common to, to have uh, morgue storage uh, be bomb proof. They didn't want, you know, splinter proof as they called it. Um, the other possibility is that it was uh, munitions or ammunition storage. Um, that's a little less likely, but but still possible. But we definitely think it was because of the construction, the way it's kind of domed like that, and there's there's so much um, concrete, brick, stone around it that it it was they were trying to keep something safe. Um, there's there was one person did mention that it could have been a crematorium, uh, but we couldn't find any records for um, for that kind of setup or, or need on Palmyra. But um, in the early days, they, they they expected Palmyra to see a lot of action. They thought the Japanese were going to were going to come pretty hard further into the Pacific. So they did build a number of things that would have been common on frontline facilities that that just never got used. So, yeah, but those are uh, those are the two best things I've heard. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, let's keep the questions coming. Um, I see some people coming off mute and some questions in chat. Um, I'll facilitate questions as, as needed. Stefan? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, hey, Jesse, this is great. Um, did you come hey, across um, um, information on um, defensive materials that they might have had, like barbed wire everywhere and anti-swimmer mines and things like that? Because we've felt like we've come across things like that in the past here and there. Uh, you've come across anything like that? 
Oh yeah, yeah. The um, again, this was especially early on. Um, you know, I, I need to find the specific numbers, but I think it was two to three weeks after Pearl Harbor, and then you know, a week after that, they got hit, like I said, um, by a, a Japanese sub. But then, two to three weeks after that, once the Marines showed up, the first thing they did was they laid wire all around the atoll. So you can imagine, and this is this is before everything was even done, right? So they just had guys basically walking in the water all the way around Palmyra. Um, they had, uh, uh, I think they call it anti-intrusion wire, which yeah, was essentially barbed wire that wouldn't immediately rust away in the ocean. Um, there's not a lot of mention of mines. It, there's a, they didn't always, you know, they didn't always document that properly, unfortunately. You think that would be the thing they noted the most clear, carefully, but um, we don't think there was too much of that, if any. There was a, a lot, though, of the anti-intrusion wire. Um, the pillboxes went up almost immediately. They had some really heavy artillery um, at the edges of the islands and lagoons. Those guns were pretty valuable, though, so they were moved off by 44 or 45. But there was, there was a lot of gun emplacements, especially on the the coasts. Um, and then there was a lot of wire that they just ran through the lagoons because they didn't want to run it, you know, overhead. And, and they, they would let it, you know, they would run it out on concrete blocks as far as it was shallow. And then they would just kind of let it drop deeper into the lagoon. So ships didn't run over it and pick it up on the other side. So there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of description of just the, the amount of, uh, metal and wire that they, they ran around and through it. Yeah. Yeah, I can um, I can dig up some more specifics. It, it's pretty crazy how much they did. Wow, so amazing. Um, there's a question from Palmyra in the chat. Was anything built for copra plantations? Yeah, yeah. Um, if there was another presentation I, I put together, it um, that would be a really interesting topic. Uh, so copra was the first thing that, uh, well, OK. Technically, the first thing Palmyra was claimed for was guano, but the guys who claimed it knew that it was not a, a good source of guano, but it could be a good source of copra. So they used the Guano Act of 1856 or whatever it was to claim it and immediately start, um, start looking at copra. Um, that's some of the first records we have. Uh, so 18, starting in 1856, people were out of Palmyra planting trees and trying to develop plantations. That stopped in, I think the, the last attempt before the war was uh, 21 to 22. That was the, the Mengs. Uh, so if you see Adele Island, which isn't, isn't there anymore, that was one of the pre-construction islands. Adele Island is named after Adele Meng, who was um, the first woman to ever live on Palmyra. She was there with her husband, and they were running a copra plantation. And then almost immediately after the war, uh, they, they looked into it again, the Fuller, Fuller Leo family did. But I don't think there was another formal attempt after the war until uh, until '79. There were some. There was a lot of discussion around it, but '79 was the. I think that was certainly the last formal attempt. And we do have some really, um, really great photos uh, from the shrimp mariculture study that um, James Maragos did in '79, um, kind of showing the the copra facilities and and some of the other. Uh, I mean, they were also there doing the nuclear uh, storage investigation, but there's some really interesting stuff about kind of the last great attempt to do copra. But yeah, that is really the, that was the thing people kept thinking they could make money on at Palmyra. But that was, uh, a lot of that was abandoned during the war and any facilities left over from the 20s had either collapsed already or removed during the construction. Wow, thank you. Um... Any other hey, questions? Uh, Go ahead, Ray. Can or, you hear me? Yes, we can uh, hear you. I was just curious with those ovens that Chad asked about, are, are you certain that they were associated with the war or is it possible they were built as ovens for drying copra? Oh, um, so we're pretty sure they were built for the war. Um, it, it's absolutely possible they could have been built afterwards. Um, the locations on the, the charts um, make it look like if they were repurposed later, there was certainly something there in that spot beforehand. Um, 
To be honest, I, they could be they could be anything uh, <laughs> like built at any time. Palmyra tends to age things in uh, very unique ways, as I'm sure you guys all know better than I do. Um, so it it confuses uh, experts, but uh, I know that there was something there during the naval occupation. Uh, the CAA maint, uh, maintained a building there. One of the the things that we found out too is that the you know the CAA came in. Uh, the Navy had torn down or not finished a lot of structures by 44. CAA comes in and they either rebuilt or built on those foundations new things. So it's also entirely possible that they, it was something built by the CAA for something they needed. Um, I, again, I'm, um, I think it's definitely something worth looking into. And, and if anybody has any, uh, yeah, evidence ideas, I'd, I'd love to hear them. Um, but, uh, yeah, my assumptions are based on the fact that something shows as being there during naval construction, if that makes sense. Um, I have another question. Uh, how? So it's just crazy to think that at any time there might have been five to six thousand people <laughs> On, at Palmyra, even if they are sleeping on their on their ships, like you said, but that's just mind boggling to imagine. <laughs> imagine yeah. Palmyra accommodating that many. And I ha sort of had two questions. One is, is in your research, is there like a typical amount of time that these the men that were actually stationed there would stay there for? And then the second question is uh, food and sustenance. Like, was it typical like, uh, you know, ship food or like what did they mostly eat when they were there? Yeah, so it's it's interesting to watch. There's a um, uh, he was he was a Marine uh, tank battalion commander who wrote letters home to his family and, and his um, his nephew. Uh, he unfortunately died at uh, I think he died at Iwo Jima, um, but he he sent letters home from Palmyra. He was stationed there for about a year, um, and he describes kind of the 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 food progress. So. He showed up there in late 41, early 42, I think, and they were, you know, occasionally getting fish. They were getting decent rations. And by the time 1943 rolls around, uh, it's it's pretty much shipboard food, even when you're on on the atoll. Um, so it's uh, it's serviceable. But, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of potatoes, a lot of canned goods. Um and whatever they, they could scrounge. You know, there's a lot of interesting stories about people having gardens. Uh, tomatoes grew pretty well out there. Um, so the the sailors would, and especially the, the the civilians and soldiers stationed there would would grow a variety of things that they could grow. And um, that was obviously in small quantities. But we, we don't have a lot of specific records about, you know, average um, average leave time or anything like that, because there was this mix of Maybe you stay at Palmyra because you only get a few days before you have to go back uh, to the, the front. Um, or maybe you're staying there for a few days before you get on to Honolulu. Uh, it looked like it was anywhere from two or three days to a week. Um, and there was a, again, there was, a, there was a pretty, especially at first, heavy complement of Marines, uh, several hundred Marines there, a lot of whom were servicing the aircraft. Um, but uh, we have like um, the uh, the war diaries, which is essentially a you know a check in check out. Here's who showed up. Here's when they left, and it seems to be anywhere from two to three to seven days. So, wow, that's a lot of turnover. Um, <laughs> like that many people being there, but then constantly leaving and <laughs> coming and going. Yeah. Um, did you find much evidence about them eating seabirds and seabird eggs, or did they just mostly eat the food that they were provided, do you think? So it's, uh, oh, the way it was explained to me once was, that, you know, a lot of these guys, they their familiarity with the Pacific was either zero. I mean, a lot of them had never left the continental United States. Um or they had been in Honolulu, uh, you know, for orientation or, or you know, the end of their basic training, um, whatever it was. And so they were kind of familiar with things there. So they were, it's interesting what they were reticent to, to engage with. The Seabirds weren't, um, that was not something they were interested in, uh, because I think they were just unfamiliar with the idea of eating Seabirds. 
Uh, the coconut crabs <laughs> were popular at first, but uh, they obviously, I think, either figured out to hide or it just got so low that people started leaving them alone. Um, it, the fish were pretty consistent uh, in, in diets when they could get them. But again, um, especially by 44, the lagoons were just, they were so decimated um, that there, there was not a lot of visible life out there. But uh, we do have a lot of, you know, kind of fun promotional almost photos of, um, you know, the uh, general high level generals uh, fishing the lagoons and, and out in the, the shallows around Palmyra. Um, there's a. Uh, I can't remember the actress's name, but there was a, you know, on a, on a USO tour visited Palmyra and, and she's holding a couple big fish in her hand. So it was, it was certainly something Palmyra was known for the fishing, but I think, I think even they knew not to do too much or there wouldn't be anything left, but um, that runs entirely counter to the, the Japanese accounts, by the way, that the Japanese were visiting Palmyra regularly until the war um, poaching seabirds. So they were just constantly hitting it up for bird skins and the meat as well. Um, so it's that was definitely something interesting to find out is what they saw as normal or, or, or edible. Wow, that's so interesting. I, I don't wanna hog all the question and answer time though. Um, any other questions from our attendees or Palmyra? Oh, we got a question in the chat from Palmyra. Do we have an idea of clam populations in the lagoon prior to constructions? That's a great question. There, there are some materials from, wow, oh, I always forget the name of the studies. So the, the, the two big studies prior to uh, the naval construction were um, the 19, uh, well, they were there in 1913 and it was published in 1914. Um, and that was that was more about the plant life, but they they did a number of studies on uh, what was in the lagoon systems as well. Um, and then there's a the U.S. exploring expedition when they visited in 1847, they took took a number of samples from the lagoons as well. So I don't know that there's numbers, but there are there are quite a few uh, lists of species um, that were represented. And uh, I'd have to go back and look and see if any of them mentioned population counts, but we do have some really good documentation on what was common there and what was what was living in the lagoons prior to, to naval construction. Any other questions? Oh, sure. I see a hand raised. Uh, go ahead, Cindy. Sorry, I got in kind of late, so you may have covered this, but uh, when did the Fuller Leo family acquire the island? How did that happen? Yeah, um, I'll try to be as brief as possible on that. Uh, so uh, technically 19... 20, I think the end of 1920 is when they purchased it from Henry Cooper, Judge Henry Cooper. Um, the story as I've heard it goes that, you know, Henry Cooper in 1912, after his exploits around the annexation of Hawaii, which are super fun to read about, um, he used some of his influence to condense the ownership of Palmyra. Um, as you can imagine, the Hawaiian deeds and documents around ownership weren't um, weren't very well kept. Uh, so he kind of used some loopholes to get everything collected into a, a single piece of ownership under him. And then in 1920, he sold it to the Fuller Leo family. Um, and then in 1921, they almost almost immediately turned around and sent the uh, the Mengs off to, um, to try their hand at uh, copra farming and guano collection and fishing anything they could, see what was valuable. But um, yeah, the, the Fuller Leos are fascinating people. They they had a, a number of things they wanted to do with it. I, I think the primary was, ha, you know, have a place to go out in the Pacific uh, like that, see if they could make some money the way other people had at, um, 
at similar, although significantly closer islands to Honolulu. Um, but uh, thankfully it was them and not somebody else because they really did do an amazing job wrestling it back from the Navy in 47 um, and then uh, um, keeping it safe from some other pretty terrible ideas people had about what to do with it. Um, I, I think they are still one of the only <laughs> imminent domain cases uh, where um, they, they got it back and they got some level of um, restitution from the government, albeit they got, you know, at the time, I think they were awarded $200,000 from the, the U.S. government after the government spent upwards of $300 million um, in adjusted dollars, something like that, um, <laughs> changing its physical shape. So I hope hopefully that, I think I rambled there for a second. Hopefully that uh, answered what you were asking about. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got another question in the chat. What kind of recreation did the soldiers partake in? Yeah, we actually have a lot of documentation about that. Um, there was everything. So these were um, these guys were really clever. If you read about the, especially like the CBs, the construction groups, and the Marines, um, they could turn anything into anything. So there were some official, uh, you know, Navy sponsored recreational facilities. There was an officers. I think they called it an officer's quarters, but it was essentially a lounge with, a, you know, there was a functioning bar and um, a smaller theater. Uh, there was uh, there were two pools, at least formal pools. There were um, tennis courts, basketball courts. We know there was a it was very popular boxing spot. So a lot of times ships would pull in and because boxing was it was reaching a pretty pretty high level of popularity in the United States uh, leading up to the war. And so a lot of the soldiers were, were pretty good boxers and Palmyra was a destination for that. So we have some really great photos. There's even a, a painting from a Life magazine around the time that they would show up and just uh, knock the junk out of each other and have a lot of fun. Um, and uh, there's there's some really cool stuff too. Like there's the uh, the sh the movie lists. So they had a, a much larger um, semi outdoor theater where they would do two to three movies every night. So when the ships would come in from Honolulu bringing supplies, they'd bring movies and um, newsreels as well, and they would show them to whoever was there. Um, there's some fun fun stuff like um, one of the Fuller Leo sons. Uh, Vincent, he went by Vincent Leslie, um, but uh, he was in a, I don't know, probably a dozen dozen movies in the from 1941 to 1949, and uh, we know that some of those movies he was in were actually shown on Palmyra. So you know the the island his family owned uh, screened some of his movies, which is funny. Um, and uh, there's yeah, there's some there's all kinds of fun lists of what they would you know put together for fun. Um, a lot of it was fishing and diving, to be honest. Like I said, these guys had, some of them had never been out of the, the Midwest or, um, this, you know, Southern States. And so they, they just really, uh, really love being in the Pacific and in, in paradise and really took advantage of it. That sounds like a fun time. <laughs> Um, any other questions from anybody? Okay. Um, well, feel free to if any if there's any last questions, feel free to um, chime in here. But um, this was really, really, really great, Jesse. Thank you so much for making the time to talk with us. So interesting. Um, each question brings more questions to my mind. Um, so anyway, I really appreciate you taking the time to share all this with us. So thank thanks, you. Thanks, Katie much. and Jesse. Um, Cindy, did you have a question? Looks like your hand might be up. Legacy hands. <laughs> thank you, Jesse. Appreciate it as always. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, guys, for, for, for listening. And if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to, to email me. Um, everybody's got my contact information. Visit, visit the archive and, and let me know what you think or let me know if you have specific questions. That's the best way for me to learn and research is knowing when people are interested in. So I'm always very excited and happy to, to, uh, 
take questions and, and see if I can answer anything. But thanks for thanks for having me, as always. <laughs>